Hey everybody, Steve Baskus here. On today's episode, we speak to a gentleman named John Gunn. John is a person I met on the WhatsApp group for Pro Tools. WhatsApp is an application that is used for socializing, communicating from one person to another. And in this group, there's about 80 or so blind or visually impaired individuals who have questions about the digital audio workstation Pro Tools. As some of you might know, I am pursuing a degree in music production and audio engineering, and Pro Tools is the industry standard recording software that is used in recording studios across the nation, across the world. And so I got talking to John and thought I would invite him on the show so he could share his story, his music, and his life. I was raised on a farm outside of Janesville, Wisconsin. And I went to the school for the blind in Janesville, but I lost my sight because of glaucoma. Now I didn't have full vision, but I had enough to uh, sight to drive, had enough sight to drive tractors. On the last episode, I spoke to a gentleman named Andre Louis, a blind musician, music composer, and producer who lives in London, England. The next few episodes are going to be blind musicians and producers because I'm interested in the subject matter uh, and and the different things they can share to, to me and to the world. I think it's important to share their stories, uh, no matter who they are how much attention they have. And there's something about blindness that I think people fail to understand because they don't get the chance to have an intimate conversation with someone who's visually impaired or blind and lives a life that is quite different than most people. John explains to me what it feels to remember something he once could see. A couple of things I really remember vividly is that, uh, well, you know, when you're a kid, you're, you're, well, if you're sick during the day, you know, uh, physically sick, and then you feel better at night. I mean, you just feel great. I can remember in my bedroom one night after this, you know, I was awake and feeling great. You know, looking at the spot of, looking at, at the floor where the moon was reflecting off, and all of a sudden, that patch started to move. I'm thinking, now that's kind of weird. Then I got, oh, that was a, a thin cloud passing overhead. I will never forget that as long as I live. What it looks like when, when, the, when the sun rises and you're in a meadow and how the uh, sun glistens off the dew. That's, those are incredible memories that I have. One night, oh, in the early evening, is in March of that year, um, a goose, while I was standing out on the porch, smoking a cigarette, I was outside, and the, the driveway is on the right-hand side of the house as you're back to it, okay? And the porch faces west. There was a lone goose coming down the driveway, um, and then he flew right in front of me, and I could hear his wings go, now that's incredible. So the next couple of days later, when I would go to work, I'd, I had a kind of a usual routine. I'd get to work early and pour a cup of coffee and go out and have a cigarette. Well, I was kind of near a field at work, and there was a whole flock of geese. They took off, and the same thing, of course, all multiplied. So those kind of incidents, I call those an audio rainbow. So I asked John how he got into music, but I want to... I want to tell you something. Not all blind people are into music. (laughs) It's a myth. Not everybody that is blind or visually impaired pursues a life of music, especially becoming a musician or a music producer or something uh, along those lines. But here's what John had to say. How I got into music is, is I mentioned that uh, I went to for the School for the Blind in Janesville. And I had a couple of uh, instructors that were blind. And uh, I, I was blessed, actually, with a great musical program. 
but one of the instructors was uh he was a violin as well he was all around um uh, you know any stringed instrument really and the other one was uh, pretty much a uh, piano or organ the first one i talked about he played you know as i said violin but in 1960 i think the crickets came to town um and then and they needed a bass player and this guy had to fill or he filled in now i'm assuming at that point he was part of the union and i'm thinking how did he do that well you know rockabilly i mean I don't, i'm not you know knocking it or whatever yeah, it's just it's fairly easy as far as you know that kind of thing so um that i thought was kind of neat later on down the road i was in um, our senior orchestra i played trumpet and i'm no i'm no Maynard ferguson by all means of course he's not either anymore but so i would play once in a while midnight mass well these two instructors the first one of them was playing organ and the second one was playing violin so this guy well while the organist was playing the the prelude the violinist was tuning his violin subtly i'm thinking how does he do that you know i was like a sophomore in school i mean i know how it's done now and uh you know but i thought that it was really incredible john went on to explain how the music of his time shaped his life and path action music was probably one of the hardest subjects in school but the exposure that we got i was about well, fifth grade and a song by Paul Morier, Paul Morier came out called Love is Blue. And this one, I was in junior orchestra and I asked the director if, if they would write, or if he could write arrangement for Love is Blue. Two days later, we were doing it. And, uh, and, that, and at that time it was a current song. And then later on, I was in pet band, but we had a couple of uh, guys, the, the last name was Hogan and they were, they were, you know, biological brothers. And that's when, now Steve, I'm sure I'm talking foreign to you, but anyway, this, the show that was syndicated back then was Hogan's Heroes. So anyway, we did, I asked him if he could write arrangement for Hogan's Heroes. So every, every time uh, one of those guys went out on the mat, we just started, da, 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 you know, and it was really kind of cool. And, um, uh, so then I was in um, sophomore, I was a, in dance band. And this, uh, what, and we go out and do some gigs every once in a while. I don't remember if we got paid. I don't think we did, but well, might have a little bit. But obviously, um, we we're going to school in more ways than one. I mean, we weren't, we weren't real professional, but I was playing drums at that time. Well, I attempted to. <clears throat> and then uh, later on, I switched over to guitar and the guy that, that directed the band, he was playing piano and he was, sh you know, I didn't have an ear for music at that point, you know, I was developing, um, but he would shout out chords right before I needed to do it. How does he do it? Well, you know, I can do that now, but you know, there was a great exposure. I mean, it, it was great. And then one time we were playing um, the Conrad Hilton in Chicago and I walk in there and you got like 1200 people eating uh, dinner, all those forks and spoons going left to right. <laughs> I went on to ask John about his work, if he had a career and he expanded on it. It's Renaissance. The original is called Advantage Learning Systems. I started there in um, 97 and I retired back in, um, 2017. Anyway, this is a software company that um, we uh, we wrote and sold educational software. The flagship program was Accelerator Reader, and that's who I worked for. And when I I worked in uh, customer support, you know, a technical support they called it, and then also the help desk, you know, under network services. So I was in both. But one thing I can remember, I in the early 2000s, you know, I was, of course, pretty much, when, well, I was using Windows. And uh, I, 
then the then Mac OS 10 came out, and um, I had to memorize, you know, everything because obviously Tiger wasn't released then. Uh, Tiger wasn't released until 2005, so everything you know that I learned was you know through mouse clicks. You know, I didn't have it of course because I couldn't use it, but I had to memorize it. And I remember I was on an email list and I was giving directions. Well, control click. No, I can't do that because it's all keyboard. And I forgot about that. However, on the other hand, it, it worked the opposite way in Windows. You know, well, you highlight a folder and shift F10. Well, no, they're not going to shift F10. You know, so it's kind of a little bit of both worlds. I, I had to, I had to give, give different directions. Sorry, I, I had to interrupt. I just wanted to let everybody know, you know, what John is talking about is assistive technology accessibility, specifically a screen reader that's built into Apple's OS. And it's remarkable. It's synthesized speech. And as you interact with the keyboard and the computer, where you move on the computer screen, those items, those icons, and those different text-based uh, uh, objects are read back to you. And Apple's screen reader is called VoiceOver. Let's keep listening to John. When I first got the Mac, uh, personally, of course, that was Tiger, uh, Mac, uh, Mac OS 10.4. And one of the greatest things I ever experienced was if I needed to reinstall the operating system, I could do it myself with no sighted assistance. At, at, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me on this. That independence, having that capability, I think is really, really important. I'd like to say that John has not let blindness or his age slow him down. My interface right next to me is an oldie but goodie, but it still works. And I'm only using High Sierra. Well, this is a Digi 003. Um, it's um, eight faders, but it's also got the audio interface built into it. And this thing is from 2006. So it's a thing called fader flick mode. And when you're in a, um, uh, a plug-in view and you need to set some parameters, immediate feedback and instead of using the encoder knobs you're using your your faders well you know you can get more accurate with a fader than you can can in an encoder knob encoder knob john explained to me that he helped a friend with a song by using his midi controllers his keyboards that he has in his home to uh, build parts of the song using specific synths or sounds plugins or different types of instruments. Let's let's keep listening and hear what he has to say. Well, I'm basically a weekend warrior, but I just um, helped produce and I played on a CD for a friend of mine, uh, just for personal use. It's um, it was okay. Um, I had, you know, I because of complete control. Um, he just plays bass and he and he writes most of the music, and then I, um, you know, I did everything else. You know, I. I used to play physical guitar a long time ago, but my fingers don't work like that anymore. So I just use one of the guitar uh, patches in a complete control. So with that, it allowed me a lot of, a lot of freedom, I mean. I asked John if he had any advice for blind and visually impaired individuals pursuing this career path, a path that would lead them to music or audio recording. And he had this to say. I guess the advice that I would give is, is a couple of things, really. Uh, of course, get the equipment. Um, I think you, in some aspects, uh, have to know your operating system a little bit, you know, where things reside, you know, the, the, uh, the whys and the wherefores. And depending on the, uh, what genre, what type of music you like, uh, go out and listen to that. I mean, YouTube is a great tool. That's, uh, I mean, I'm sure you would agree with that or whatever. Google something, whatever. And if you like that kind of stuff, um, listen and to see how it's done. 
and don't be afraid to ask questions.